Hey everyone, welcome to the Paw Awareness Podcast and thanks for joining me. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. And also check us out at pawawareness.org and on Instagram at pawawareness underscore official. On Instagram, we are doing submissions for Pet of the Week where you can submit your foster pet and we'll pick one winner every month and we'll give $200 to their choice of charity or foster. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoy this episode. Hey everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the Paw Awareness Podcast. Today I have Stacey LeBaron on with the Community Cat Podcast. And if you've been listening, you know that I've done an episode with her before. But really quick, I'm just going to go ahead and have her, you know, kind of introduce herself again for all of you new listeners out there. And go ahead, Stacey. Thank you so much for coming on. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me on the show again. I really appreciate it. And I'm Stacey LeBaron. I'm the the head cat at the Community Cats podcast, uh, where we have a lot of educational materials for all the folks that want to turn their passion for cats into action is basically that's my my theme is how to turn your passion for cats into action. We have a podcast, Community Cats Podcast, and you can subscribe to it. We've been around since 2016, and we're just approaching about our 400th episode. And basically, the podcast is a place where we just share ideas about how folks are doing really cool things to help cats in their communities. It's very conversational. The episodes are nice and short, you know, 20 to 30 minutes. Things that you could do while you're sitting in your car waiting for that last cat to get in that trap at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> binge listen to the, the podcast. But we also have expanded in 2018. We expanded and we started doing some online conferences. So we have the online cat conference, uh, online kitten conference, and we now have a United Spay Alliance conference. And we have other, other days too that are, are really educational too. Yeah. Since the last time that we talked, it was like middle to late part of 2020. It looks like you have a ton of stuff going on. So it's February 2nd now when we're recording this, but it was just this last weekend, there was community cat conference. I know we were kind of talking about that, but for someone listening that wants to attend this, what is that all about? And what can someone expect? Could you just talk about that a little bit? Sure, sure. So my weekend conferences, so we just had the online cat conference where we had presentations from folks talking about how to start your own trap new to return program. So trap new to return is if you want to assist with getting the cats in your neighborhood spayed and neutered so that they're not going to have kittens. And so there are a lot of folks interested in starting these programs. So we had that type of a session. We also had a panel session talking about men in the industry because in animal welfare, we are pretty much of a female dominated industry. And so talking about how we can get more men as well as men of color involved in the um, industry more. And then we also had a community cat coordinator panel. We talked about feline health, FIP, and feline kitty biome, uh, how to start a spay neuter clinic and how to increase foster homes. So that was sort of the lineup that we had this past weekend. Going into February, we're doing the United Spay Alliance Conference. I don't know if you knew, but February is spay neuter like awareness month. It's called feline fix by five month. And so we're celebrating everything about spaying and neutering in the month of February. And February 23rd is World Spay Day. And so it's really a time for us to focus on, you know, folks being able to get um, access to affordable spay neuter services. And so February 26th through the 28th, we will have this long conference. Um, it'll be Friday night. We kick it off with a couple of hours and then we are all online from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time, all day Saturday and all day Sunday. Presentations are all recorded. You don't have to feel like you have to sit there all day long. So if folks wanna you know, sign up and tune in for some of the live sessions and then, then also you know, check in on the recordings later, those recordings are available for a year after the conference. That's so cool that despite, you know, all of the stuff going on with the pandemic that you guys are able to do that and that have those online conferences. And what medium do you use? Like, is it, you know, Zoom, Skype, Google Hangouts? What's that like? We actually use uh, GoToWebinar, which is sort of this old school, you know, online service, but we still use GoToWebinar for our conferences and it works out really well. That's awesome. Okay. I was just wondering, you know, like what, it seems like everyone's using something different. What do I need to download? And so I wasn't able to attend that this last weekend. So, okay. So you have one coming up at the end of February. 
And what are some things that you're working on right now? I know that you you talked about, you know, you've, you're approaching 400 episodes. I think that you said before the call, you're reaching that April, May ish. Yep. What yep. are some yep. things that you're working on that you're really excited about this year? Obviously, you know, the educational content and right now it's spay and neutering. What other topics have you covered educationally and what are you excited that you're working on? Yeah, so we also have a behavior day that that comes up in April. So that will have Arden Moore, Pam Johnson Bennett, Rachel Geller, as well as Tabitha Crucera. They're all four nationally renowned um, feline behaviorists that will be joining us for the day and sharing, obviously, lots of tips and tricks around litter box issues, James, issues behavior day, which is going to be on April 17th, really will provide a lot of tools and tips. We have our online kitten conference um, in June. We have a feline leukemia day in, in July. And then um, we also have trapper training certification workshops, which is the first Saturday of every month. So say you've got a couple of cats in your backyard and you want to be able to help them, but you don't know how to do how to trap a cat. How would you go about doing that? How would you rent a trap? Where would you find spay neuter appointments? And so we have monthly, the first Saturday of every month, we do trapper certification workshops in partnership with Neighborhood Cats. And this is the place. It's only $10. These workshops are cheap. You just, you have a little quiz at the end and you'll get a certificate. And in some communities, you can get things like reduced cost spay neuter sur- surgeries, or even free if you have one of these certificates. So depending on where you live, you might get some benefits by having the certificate. And we get you know anywhere from 200 to 400 attendees at these events um, every the first weekend of every month, and you can also find out about that more about that at communitycatspodcast.com. We have all this information all over our website, but that's a great resource if you want to take like a first step into helping in your community. Yeah, and no matter what medium you're listening on, I will have a link to that easily to access in the description below. What are some things that you, you know, obviously you've been doing this for a while, right? Like, what's that core motivation that keeps you going forward? Is it just habit at this point? You know, is it like, what's what's that just keeps pushing you farther and farther doing all these educational events? Because it's really motivating to see, you know, you're always looking to bring more people in, but it's those core people that just really keep the community strong. What's that motivation for you? It's funny because um, I get so much feedback from the folks that attend um, our events as well as the podcast. I mean, people email me, you know, at any given time. I get to hear the stories of what they're doing. And 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 they they say, you know, Stacy, you're really helping me. You gave me some great ideas. I thought about things that I hadn't thought about before. You know, you helped me merge with another organization that I never thought I would reach out to, but we've really been able to complement one another. I mean, just thinking about different ideas of how folks can better leverage the resources they have in their community to be able to help community cats. Um, and it's those individual stories and, and the listeners and the people that attend the events that really inspire me. And I also have a community cats grants program where an organization, if they raise a thousand dollars to support a spay neuter for owned cats or community cats, we will match that thousand dollars for them. And these are small grassroots organizations, you know, have revenues of under $25,000. And that's a lot of money to those groups. And it's really exciting to see them grow. Many of the groups that we started funding back in 2017, they've grown and they're now, you know, at $200,000 a year in revenue. And it's just really excited to see, exciting to see like, you know, the small groups grow and be able to do more and help more cats. So it's really the listeners that keep me going. That's so cool too, especially since you probably get so many different questions and whatnot. And I think to become a master at something, it's when you get all of those different questions, it kind of speeds up the learning curve. So why, you know, you probably just this wealth of information, you've probably seen so many nitty gritty questions tossed your way. That's awesome. And if a super small organization is listening to this and they, you know, how do they, reach out to you about those grants, or maybe, I don't know if there's a waiting list or application or how that works, but what's that like? Right. The Community Cats Grants Program does have an application and it is on the website. So you just go to communitycatspodcast.com and scroll down. And at the bottom of the website, there is um, a grant tab there. And you can just click on that button and it'll show you the application and it'll give you information. There's actually a video 
you can watch there that talks about the application process. So, you know, feel free to find the information out there. Folks are also always welcome to email me directly. My email is public. It's all over the place, which is Stacy S-T-A-C-Y, at communitycatspodcast.com. They can email me with any questions and I'm happy to assist. Perfect. Yeah, that's all. Like I said, I'll have all that for all you guys in the description below. Okay. So what are some things that, I mean, you see, we kind of touched on this just a little bit ago where you're seeing so many different organizations and whatnot. Is there a common theme of problems that you're seeing or is it kind of a mixture just depending upon location and whatnot? Or is there a theme that you're seeing across everyone that you're working with? So obviously COVID has provided a lot of challenges and animal welfare has changed dramatically over over COVID. So organizations that may have had large adoption centers with, you know, 100, 150 cats and adopt them out there, they're now doing everything foster care based with a much lower population of cats in their facilities. So the way folks are thinking about cats in their programs has changed dramatically. So instead of taking a cat in that might need medical care from a family that can't afford that medical care. Organizations are now pivoting so that they're providing financial assistance to that family so that they can get the veterinary care for that cat, but they don't have to surrender the cat. So those kinds of things are changing. Pet food pantries have really grown exponentially. Um, And, you know, as 30% of the population experience some sort of financial hardship and need some sort of support. So the growth at the pet food pantries has been really incredible. And I could, I could spend an hour talking about how to distribute pet food. I'm president of a group here in Vermont called Positive Pantry. And I also run an organization task force out of Massachusetts, two totally different pet food distribution models but yet extremely effective and powerful. And uh, so I've really learned a lot about how to get pet food to uh, the folks that need it um, during this really incredibly crazy time that we're in. But the industry of animal welfare and the sheltering programs, they're definitely changing a lot and being more social service oriented rather than rescue oriented. Okay, and a couple of questions here. So when... A family is trying to get, uh, you know, help with their cat. Are they just put in touch with a special, like, are there, are there certain designated vets then, or is it just, you go to any vet and then it's, I don't like kind of like an insurance or something. We may cover you. We, We may not like, how does that work? So there's a variety of different programs and it really depends on what the local organizations, you know, are in your area. There are programs like waggle.org, which you can actually post a story about your, your pet and that you need assistance. And then people will donate to that. And they have specific veterinarians that are connected. You would have a connection with that veterinarian. So they have, that's an online program. That's all national. But then there's also smaller programs with individual organizations. So one organization might have their own veterinary clinic on site. So they can do a lot of the work internally. But then another organization that might not have a clinic, they would have to work with private veterinarians and they would liaison with the private veterinarians and say, well, maybe we'll pay up to five hundred dollars of your bill. We cannot we can't cover the whole thing, but maybe we can go up to this point. So it's more like a grant program to an individual. So there's a lot of different models around that. But, you know, there those resources are growing significantly. And so hopefully more people will have access to that. So there won't be economic euthanasia or else also surrender due to the economic stress for a cat with special needs. And if someone wants to figure out, you know, maybe if that's something that's a good fit for them, can they find that on your website? So that kind of information, uh, folks can always reach out to me and say, here, I've, you know, I've got these challenges, I've got this problem, they can reach out and I can funnel them through to, you know, appropriate organization locally. If they're in a a state, there's the United Spay Alliance website, unitedspayalliance.org, which is really an association of statewide leaders that have all the spay neuter clinics listed, but inevitably they handle a lot of these kinds of questions too, so they might know more on a local level what programs are around for veterinary assistance. So if you need spay neuter help, you know, you can't, you got a, someone gave you a cat or a kitten that's not spayed or neutered. The United Spay Alliance can, there's a map and click on the and that will 
to a clinic that could help you. And they would also, if you need veterinary care above and beyond that, they'd be able to give you a lead probably from that site too. Perfect. Okay. That's fantastic. I know that you mentioned that you're, you work on getting pet food to organizations that need the pet food, right? So what is the primary obstacle that you're dealing with there? Like, what's the main issue? Is it like the logistics? Is it just kind of facilitating that? Like, what does that look like? I can't, you know, I I can't even imagine. So yeah, each state is is totally different. I'm sure the challenges are different in the other states that I'm not as intimately familiar with. But so there are challenges with, um, so the, the dream is to have pet food in with the human food in, you know, people food shelves. We call them food shelves in Vermont. We call them food pantries in Massachusetts. I don't know what you call them where you are, but we, everybody seems to have a different name for things. But anyway, so we had a lot of food shelves don't carry pet food and we would like to include pet food in that. So we had to reach out to them individually to see if we could convince them to carry pet food. And I would say about 60% of the time, if you reach out to them individually, they will say yes. Many of them are restricted due to space constraints and so that they can't do the pet food, but these organizations will take it. So in Massachusetts, it's like we have a designated volunteer that will bring food to that specific food shelf and provide them with food. So it's very labor intensive. And then in in Vermont, we pay for food at the Vermont Food Bank and they just distribute through their system. So it's more of uh, we're funding the food purchase and it will go through the Vermont Food Bank system and the organizations can choose and select to take pet Massachusetts, it's a bit different where we're doing a lot of the legwork ourselves independently. Wow. That's, I didn't even know that that was a problem. And are you working with like manufacturers that make this or retailers? Like, what does that look like? So I kind of reference our program in Massachusetts as sort of like um, match.com for retailers to food pantries. So basically what our volunteers do is they liaison a a bit with a local retailer that will do food drives. They'll donate food that's going to expire soon. They will give gift cards and we'll just buy food there to help support their business. And then we take that food and deliver it to like the closest food shelf that would take pet food. So um, our volunteer is sort of getting it from point A to point B which then in turn gets it out to the community and into the public to families with pets that need the food the most. And so it's, it's turning that supply over very quickly. So we do that and we have a list of like 130 retailers as well as a list of over a hundred food pantries that we support. And it's sort of this matchmaking now in some parts of the state, they may need more food supplies. So we will move food from one part of the state to the other to help supply the food pantries that are listed in that area, or we'll move food to the other side. So we have this big network of statewide connections so that we know where like our supply is heavier and our demand is heavier. And we'll just reshift our resources that way. That's ingenious. That's so cool. (laughs) And I, you know, I mean, I'm sure we've all seen that these animals that need food and that's amazing that you're getting it into the right hands. I have, I know one company in Chicago and they reached out to me. I just didn't really know where to point them. So maybe I can direct them to you and maybe I don't, I know you don't yes. you know, work in Illinois, but maybe it seems like, you know, everyone. So <laughs> you can just maybe direct them to the right, the right people. But yeah, I, that's such a great podcast. Stacy. I feel like I could talk to you about this stuff all day. Thank you so much for coming on. Always bringing new issues that I didn't even know, you know, some of the people I talked to, I didn't even know that were, they were an issue. So that's always fun for me to kind of shed light on that and hopefully shed light with some of my viewers. But lastly, and I know you've kind of touched on it, where can people find you? What social medias? Oh, certainly. Yeah. So we are on Facebook at Community Cats Podcast, Instagram, Community Cats Podcast. Um, We're on Twitter. And you also can find me personally on LinkedIn if you are professional. And for folks, if you're at all interested in how to get involved and engaged with supporting Pet Food Initiative, you know, email me at Stacy at Community Cats Podcast. I'd be happy to get you connected, um, looped in, because I think at this point in time, with regards to our financial situation, 
the pet food is going to be really critical over the next several years and um, along with, you know, eviction issues and those kinds of things. So, you know, we just need to group together to ensure that every pet out there has the opportunity to stay with their family. That's so important, right? Just making sure the pets stay with their loved ones. So that's amazing. One person can make a difference. A couple people can change the world. So seriously, thank you so much. I will have a link to everything in the description below, whatever you're listening on. Thanks, Stacey, for coming on. Thanks, Chris.